So he is with um, Aaron and is a chief technical officer with Aaron. And he's going to talk with us with respect to IPv6 security. So, uh, Thank you. So you have your height and your distance, you can see out in the future, 
you, well, not in the future. You can see on the distance, you can see people coming. And the other thing is you can see what's actually you're allowing the door. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about, and this is, this is a talk I'm starting to develop um, dealing with CGNs. And it's going to be a little bit different. So this, this is a talk that um, I'm starting to evolve. You're going to see the very beginning of it. But this is going to be a um, bigger deal in the future. So tunnel providers. So let's talk about V6 security. Tunnel providers. Anyone have a V6 tunnel today? OK, cool. Do they work? <laughs> For the most part, yeah. right? But they do break. So one of the things that you want is you want to have a reliability tunnel provider. Vulnerabilities. We heard about some of these, uh, uh, these uh, issues with six to four tunnels, right? You, you have DDoS attacks. You're not exactly sure what comes in, what goes out of it. Um, next thing is multiple protocols. You have more things you really have to consider and you, you have to actually manage. So on V4, it's very simple. You say, I only allow web traffic in. I only allow SSL in. I don't allow anything else in. Well, V6 is a little bit different, and you need to be aware of that. Cross-contamination. V4 encapsulating V6. V6 encapsulating V4. And how's that being decapsulated? And how's that working out? So those complexities are also things that you need to be concerned with in uh, your network. Six to four routers and relays, we talk, Christian talked about in great detail. I'm not going to talk about that very much. Here's a couple of really long RFCs if you want to read about some of these issues. So it's been well versed, those, it's been well thought of in the community. Access control. V4 and V6, as I mentioned, have separate ACLs. So if you have a firewall that understands V4 and V6, you also have to have equivalent sort of policy sets for both. But they're both different. And there are, there are minor changes that you need to make on them. Um, crafting these, cons these policies are difficult. Um, Aaron himself runs both V4 and V6 and has for a long time. We're going to talk about that this afternoon. But one of our biggest headaches is actually the management of our firewalls and making sure that we have consistent policies between both V4 and V6. And I'm sure you will too. Application OS behavior is inconsistent. So um, V4 has been around for a long time. A lot of exploits have been uh, basically unearthed on the internet. They're yet to be found on V6. So that's it's a maturity level. It's something that needs to be worked on. Um, firewalls, um, internet detection systems, et cetera, have weak, weak V6 support. Um, we at Aaron have seen this ourselves. Middleware providers are, are um, they're just not quite there yet, even today. So V6 has been OSs for many years, but the stacks aren't battle tested, as I mentioned before. Applications are certainly not well tested. Uh, Apache might be, but there are others that are not. And this is something that needs to be worked out as well. Uh, smacks, uh, stack smashing is one of the big techniques that's used out there. Can I create some, craft some packet to actually overflow the guy on the other side so I can get root access? So those are big things that are, are going to be exposed as you move to v6. Um, and of course, there's many unknowns to v6 impl implementations. A lot of vendors, especially middleware, middle, middle box vendors, have their own sort of networking stack. And V4 it was well, really well known, V6 not so well known, lots of issues with it. Um, and I, I actually have whips on my back that, that, um, that show that sort of thing. <laughs> um, here's some of the pros. Since it's new, no one really understands it very well. So the exploits are really well known. Um, another thing, it, it's really difficult to scan V6 networks, right? You, you try to scan basically uh, internets of internet's address space and try to figure out what hosts are behind there. Good luck with that. <laughs> um, so it's very hard to get a guess addresses, very hard to guess addresses. Um, and of course, it, the pen testers, do you, you, you know what a pen trace is? Those people that are dealing with, um, um, dealing with uh, the telco side, it's basically when the law enforcement agency comes in and says, hey, look, I want to track that guy's, who he's calling. I don't want to get, I don't want to hear his, his conversations, but I want to know what numbers he calls. And that's called a, a pen trace, and the, the pen testers is basically the same thing in V6. Um, and this, this allows hackers 
all different ways to see, okay, who, who's coming from where and how's this going, watching the flows is just much, much harder because you have different, uh, uh, much larger number of V6 addresses to try to guess for. Uh, now here's the big one. So stateless auto configuration. So who's gone to a conference where you've had both V4 and V6? Okay, great. How many of those people actually have people go up in the audience and say, hey, someone has RAs turned on, could you please turn it off? <laughs> All right, this is another problem. So auto, stateless auto configuration is actually kind of one of the nightmares on, on, on V6 at the moment, especially when we go to these conferences because someone will, on their, on their machine, well-intentioned or not, say, hey, look, I'm a router, go ahead and send all your traffic to me. And all these other laptops will say, okay, I'll send my traffic to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that certainly um, it, it is an issue, and you don't have that on V4. But sure you have, you can, you can do very, the same sort of thing on V4, but it's much harder than, to do on V4 than on V6. And a lot of times this is self-inflicted, so I, I kind of smirk when, when we finally figure out, because at the air conferences we run V6, and we go and we say, okay, that's the guy that has his RA turned on. So we'll go over and tap him on the shoulder and say, turn that thing off. And he'll get really embarrassed, and he's actually someone that usually, these are people that are really trying to make the network work, but they just kind of forgot something when we went to the conference to turn it on. So, uh, enterprise considerations as you go to V6. Middleware functionality is not one to one. So, if you have a load balancer in your network, guess what? They'll say they have V6 connectivity, uh, V6 awareness, and, and you can do things with V6, but you can't do all the same things with V6 as you could with V4. So, you're going to lose, lose some functionality. There's definitely more thought on V4 because customers have demanded that. Um, these middleware providers are, and, and the same thing goes with the maturity and security characteristics on, on it as well. Uh, it's just more thought given than before. There's undocumented gotchas. So Cisco APs. Um, at the there's a there's a conference that's going around the Caribbean. It's called Cribnoc. Has anyone gone to the Cribnoc? Okay, there's a few. So at the last Cribnoc, um, we actually set up a V6 segment and uh, on. And as an experiment in the room, and all the technologists were all working, and half the room it worked, and the other half it didn't. The half, well, actually, this is kind of interesting. The Mac guys were on this side of the room, and all the Windows guys were on that side of the room. <laughs> so, um, and the Mac guys couldn't get V6 to work, whereas the Windows guys could. Well, it turns out the Macs like to use like uh, 811A. And the other guys were using 811N. The WAP, the, the wireless access point on the front, did V6 over N, but not A. That's, that was bizarre. Um, another thing is ICMP filtering. It changes on, on V6 and it causes MTU issues if you just turn ICMP off. You need to turn it on for, for at least uh, path discovery. Um, host considerations. So how many of you guys actually run Windows here? How many are brave enough to say they want to run Windows? <laughs> okay, cool. How many of you guys have uh, the, like uh, uh, antivirus on your boxes? And it's coupled with a firewall. How many of you guys with AV and firewall have tried to run V6? <laughs> Does it work? Yeah. It doesn't work with semantic. And it doesn't work with a couple other vendors as well. So guess what? You have to get those guys to actually upgrade their, their AV stuff to do their thing. Otherwise, you've got to turn it off. Boy, that sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, you also need to ensure third-party clients have V6 interfaces. Uh, that goes without saying. So uh, recap implementation. Uh, tunnels are less desirable and native because of you know up, down, doesn't work, doesn't now work. Not all transit is equal, and this is certainly true on V6. Uh, V6, there's a handshake. It's going away now because now people have it on their product documentation. Okay, V6 costs this much if you want to hook up with me. Um, before it was just hand shaking, you need to know the guy in the back office someplace. Uh, routing is not as reliable, but it's getting better every day. Uh, dual stack is not so bad now, and uh, probably you can't get dual stack. 
Um, dual stack does make the policy more complex. Remember I was talking about saying your firewall rules. Definitely more complex there. Uh, security vendors are behind on V6. They're not quite there yet. We talked about the, your, your firewall on, on your semantic, for example. Uh, V6 stacks are relatively untested because they're just newer. Um, lack of that is a good thing, but we're going to talk about something else that's coming up that's kind of not so good. Um, you can read about uh, coexistence and security considerations in RFC 4942 if you want to go into it a little bit deeper. Okay, one of the things that we did at the CribDog meetings is saying, okay, look, if you're not, you haven't run V6 yet, we're going to teach you how to run V6, and we went ahead and actually did this. And we uh, discussed how to set this up at CribDog 3. We set up a firewall and how you do that with V6 in CribDog 2. And I, I need to talk to the organizers, but I'm gonna, we're going to see about making those presentations available for you guys who actually want to start playing with these things. It's step-by-step -step instructions how to make that go. I, basically, when you do this, you slowly enable a service at a time, and that's certainly something that Aaron has done. And you work on basic services first, DNS, S SMTP, web. Um, and remotely test your, your connections. Ask a friend if you're not sure if you're doing the right thing, if your friend is V6 savvy. Maybe not if he's not so much. <laughs> okay, uh, considerations as you go forward, V6 buy-in, improvements, network costs, and whether or not your network's large enough to deal with V6, or if your ISP actually has V6, or allows things to go through. These are all considerations you need to go with. Um, V4 and V6 coexistence. There's a lot of pressure for V4 space we're starting to see, right? So who has some IP addresses that they're willing to sell? <laughs> Anyone here? Oh, all right. There's, actually, there's people who are interested in buying those today, right? So it's no, you can, you can come to an internet registry, you go to Carlos, so you come to me, and you can get essentially free space. Or you can go in the market and buy it. Um, and people are actually buying space that they can actually get essentially, not quite free, but close to free from an internet registry. Why is that? Why, do, why are people doing this? Did anyone have any ideas? It resells one. Okay. Is there any others? Shortage. Shortage? Yeah. Or maybe they're seeing some issues with this coexistence that we're dealing with, right? So V4 or V6, what if the, what are the issues that if, if you talk to some of the people who actually help make those decisions, is frankly they'll they'll tell you behind closed doors that we didn't we botched this whole sort of transition scheme up pretty badly. We don't have a really great transition scheme. So you heard Christian talk about all these different mechanisms, none of which work great for everybody. There's all kinds of issues. So we're going to move on to CGNs here and what's going to happen. So who, who here runs a NAT? Let's first, there's two different types of NATs. Who, who runs the subscriber-based NAT? Everybody, right? You have one in your home. I have one in my home. It's okay. <laughs> um, you're running off a of private address space, right? RFC 1918 address space. And I remember back in the day with, oh, this is awful. You know, we need to make everything globally accessible. Everybody from every box in their house. We can't have this idea of private address space, right? Because everything needs to be unique. Well, it turned out that NAT using private address space been a wild success, right? And it's reduced the pressure on V4 runout. And almost everybody has it. Um, one, of the, one of the great things is that the middle boxes and stuff like that, they're not only are they NAT boxes, but they're typically firewalls, so people behind them actually have some sort of modicum of security. So it's actually a good thing. Now let's talk about carrier, carrier grade NAT. So I talked a little bit about before about the pressure on V4. What carrier grade NAT does is it brings on that non-uniqueness into the carrier space as well. So you got it on your home network, now the carrier's going to do as well. So it adds more complexity, but again, it slows down the runoff. And it's one of the things that ISPs are seeing is, okay, I can move to V6, but if I go to V6, I have to change out all these modems 
at various houses, many of which my customers will scream bloody murder that they have to spend 50 bucks at Best Buy or some other, <laughs> um, some other sort of uh, place to get new equipment, right? So they don't want to go through that pain and they don't want to go through the support costs. So they're seeing carrier grade as, as a viable alternative. Now, so as, as we go through, actually I'm going to go talk about this a little bit more. So if you talk to the equipment manufacturers out there in the industry, the, the Cisco's, the Juniper's and stuff like that, guess what they're going to say to you? Buy it. There you yeah, go. And guess what? They're selling it. They're selling lots of it. So, okay, so ISPs are actually embedding this in their network. So when they turn it on, what happens? Does anyone have any idea? It's going to break a couple things. It's going to break my son's Xbox. Um, that's going to make him unhappy. Um, what else is it going to break? It's going to it's going to break things like VoIP, anything that needs pinholes, right, going through your NAT device to actually get access. It's going to break a lot of things. But these these ISPs are seeing this as, hey, I don't have a great transition mechanism, and CGMs is about the best I can do. So they're actually deploying. Now what they're waiting for is for the first ISP to turn it on. Because that <laughs> so, so you think about it. The first ISP that turns it on, they're gonna be they're gonna be the ones that say, these guys are awful. <laughs> right? Because it's gonna break everything. And but everybody else, that will slow down, and this is a hypothesis. That, that's going to slow down, but the other ISPs will say, okay, that guy took the brunt of the, the punishment, I'll go ahead and turn mine on too. And we, we've had some history, we have some context for this. Who remembers SiteFinder back, back in um, oh, when, early 2000? 2001, somewhere around there? So SiteFinder was, it, it was something at Verisign, I worked for Verisign by the way. Um, it was something at Verisign did where if you ask, um, for a non-existent domain that ended in .com, VeriSign would actually helpfully resolve it and bring up a web page and say, uh, that name doesn't exist, maybe you were meant to go to one of these other sites. It broke a bunch of things. Um, and ICANN, the US government, all kinds of people went up in arms about it and, I, and uh, VeriSign had to turn it off. But what it did start, as ISP said, hey, this is a great way to get revenue. So I'm going to start these non-existent uh, domain services in my own network. And so if you go to various places, especially in the United States, you ask for a non-existent domain name. Oh, I typed that wrong. Um, it, it comes up with a helpful page that's ad-supported that allows you to go to the site you want to. Or maybe not. Um, but but those, that is some precedent for what's going to happen here. So let's go see what it looks like. Okay. So. And, and I'm going to argue also that the next thing is that CGNs are going to be here for a long time. As long as we have coexistence, we're going to have CGNs. Because if you think about it, if you're on a V4 network and you want to go to a V6 site, you're going to have to have a, some sort of network address box that goes allows you to go to that V6 site. Same thing if you're a V6 only client at your home and you want to go to a V4 site, you're going to have to use this CGN to get to that site. So it's going to be a part of our network for a long time. And here's a good example of one where you're a V6 customer and you're going through, oh, did I miss one? Yeah. Um, here's, here's a V6 customer going through a CGN to a V4 only content site, right? On all the rest of them, he's fine. If it's dual stacked or V6, he's fine. And here's another one where you have V6, a V4 customer going through a V4 uh, CGN to go to a V6 only site. So both these things are going to be some sort of reality in the future. Now we can move to the host. So we have a, a dual stack uh, ISP, maybe the customer's not. And depending on what sort of configuration he is and where he needs to go, he may also have to go through a CGN <coughs> before going to a site. So these things are going to be embedded in our, in our culture. <laughs> it's going to be embedded in the internet here. So as I mentioned that, I said that they're going to be embedded in the network for a while. And frankly, you're not going to know if you're, going to be, if you're behind one. If it's subscriber base, you know it because you set it up. But in this case, your ISP, unless something breaks, you're just not going to see it. 
Um, and frankly, if things break, you're going to you're going to blame Microsoft if your Xbox breaks. Say, why can't I get to your site? Um, you might go through your ISP for it, but you're going to blame Microsoft for initially because you don't know what's going on. At least you're the clue for once. So you probably go to your ISP and say, what's broken here? Uh, but if not, you'll probably go to the Microsoft support site and say, why can't I play with my friends anymore? So it's an issue. So some say that this isn't a big deal uh, going from NAS to CGMs because they're kind of just a natic, and we know that it works. It provides a modicum of security. Actually, it, you don't know what's behind there. The, the hackers don't throw on the outside, but they can still get through. Um, that breaks applications, you can fix it because you have control. You have this, you can say, hey, look, let me enable this thing called um, Port Network Protocol, PNP, that opens up a, a port for a particular um, service that you may want. You can't do that very easily with CTNs. And frankly, it gives more implications for security instance, and we're going to talk about that specifically. So this is, this is what draws law enforcement crazy. So right now, if you, if you get a law enforcement request, the law, the law enforcement agency says, hey, look, can you tell me, at, at, from this interval to this interval, did this particular IP address actually come and communicate with you and give me their laws? Well, if you're behind the CGM, it gets different. What do you need? You also need to have the port. Because you need to know the source port. Otherwise, that the guy who's running the carrier gray net says, wait a minute, I, that particular IP address just went that way, that way, that way, I don't know, because I have multiple guys behind that particular IP address. I also need to know the source port. So, okay, so so the, the hosting provider now needs to not only map, it, log that particular IP address, where it's going, but also has to get the port. So that's definitely a, a, a add on the hosting side. The content provider needs to map all these things, right? This guy started over here. He went through my carrier grade NAT to go over over yonder, and so they have to do all kinds of additional logging more than they did so in the past. Uh, and the timestamps are important too because these things change as as the moments go on. An additional problem with CGNs. Not all CGNs are created equal. <laughs> Unfortunately, and this is really bad on the ITS perspective, there was never any good requirements put on, on that. And consequently, CGNs falls in that category. And frankly, these vendors, hey, they're willing to sell you the box. How much was it? Half a million bucks? So, half a million bucks, hey. I'll sell you something that's not standard. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can see that this is we're going to be in kind of a world of hurt because CGNs, they're going to be better in the network. You're not going to know you behind them. It's going to have inconsistent behavior because there's no require no standards on these things yet. So these are things that are all kind of upcoming that we need to, and frankly, we're behind the eight ball on it. So CGN is essentially, the business case for this is CGNs are, I looked at the ISP says, hey, here's a hedge that I can put in so I can get both V4 and V6 connectivity actually working. It's an interim solution. But frankly, and, and we talked about this a little bit before, about the business costs, the actual real business costs. You not only have the costs with actual buying hardware, but you're going to have support costs too associated with it. But frankly, from their perspective, the, all the other all their other costs are just overwhelming too, doing dual stack, which is a recommended solution, but it still it's going to be, it, it's a very expensive solution as well. Encouraging V6 is really the only enduring sort of viable alternative in the long run, but in the short run, CGNs are going to be around for a while. And, and actually, that's one of the things I, I'm, I'm sort of, we want to move to V6, we want to make it happen. CGNs are going to be around, maybe not your ISP. If you're, you're smart enough, you'll say, hey, look, I'm going to build my network, I'm going to have these 6 in the core, and I'm going to start pushing it now towards the edge. So you can get beyond the CGN nightmare that's going to occur much faster than some of the other guys. But it's going to be here. So with that, are there any questions? <laughs> yeah? Are you involved with the world timestamp issue? 
I'm um, sorry? The world time zone and time stamp issue that's going on with servers in our area, is that something RN speaks to? Or is that part of their responsibility? No. So ac actually, one of the things that I am involved with uh, outside of Aaron, many of us wear many hats. And I, I, I work in ITF doing standards work. Um, also, I sit on various committees. One of them is the is I, I can Security and Stability Committee, and actually, this is work that we're grappling with within the Security and Stability Committee is actually how to deal with CGNs, and part of that is basically the whole time stamping issue. So um, it, it's just that that's actually a small component of the, of the larger pie. And actually, what law enforcement has come to ICANN for is ICANN. Can you help us out here because we're seeing a problem, and this is dealing with addressing. So they're seeing some sort of. Um, they want. They need. To, uh, we all need to kind of get together and sort of understand this a little bit better. How we want to go forward. So I think I am the last thing between you and lunch. So right. <laughs> now, did I put you all asleep? No. Oh, good. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. We're we'll, we'll going to be moving on now with um, lunch. Lunch will be served just the next. Um,